426, Chapter 35 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 432. Welcome to Crap Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 426, Confetti and Clay. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? How is your summer if you're in the Northern Hemisphere? And are you keeping warm if you're in the Southern Hemisphere? I cannot even imagine being cool at all. It has been so humid here and so hot. All of the horrible, horrible rainstorms that have been happening in the United States, in the, in the Gulf states, uh, down in Louisiana, where they've gotten like 25 inches of rain in 36 hours, which is ridiculous and, and killing people. All of that humidity has come up to us. And so we're getting occasional rainstorms that always take out the power, which has made this recording kind of interesting. But we haven't gotten nearly the rain, so there's no break in the humidity or weather. It is just stifling and drippy. And it's a little dangerous to run a microphone <laughs> when sweat is dripping. <laughs> Not so good. But this morning it is early. I left the fans running overnight. And so the recording booth is kind of cool ish. And I have a really, really good chapter for you today. Before we get to it, though, I do have not crafty chat. Erica is doing that on her own this week because she is awesome. So if you want to go and look at the live stream at the youtube.com slash lowercase c slash craftlit dash channel. If you just remember craftlet dash channel, you should be able to get there. You can go and watch what she is sharing because she's always doing amazing stuff. I am actually working on things that I'll be able to share in September. So I'm kind of excited about that. But on July 31st this year, someone who is a listener contacted me about a treatment for mosquito bites. I could have sworn it was on Facebook. I have not been able to locate the post. So if you are responsible for getting me this information, you must call in and claim your genius. This is a product that's been around for a really long time, and it's used in all sorts of fancy schmancy spa treatments and soaps and all this stuff. But if you just buy it in a bag, it's really not very expensive at all. I bought mine, and I'm going to tell you what it is. I got it from Mountain Rose Herbs. This was sent to me. It's a, like a mail order company. It was shipped to me. I got it so fast and it was so inexpensive. And it is a one pound bag of Fuller's Earth Clay. Now you can do facials out of this. You can you know make pastes. You can make poultices. You can do all sorts of really wacky things with this. But I made a warm kind of slurry of this stuff and put it last night on my leg where I had a mosquito bite, the kind that could easily keep me up for three days. And boom, gone. It is marvelous. I love it. And it's killing me that I can't remember who told me about it because I bookmarked the page and then we had a blackout and I lost all my bookmarks. So there it is. But I'm putting a link to the product in the show notes please call 206-350-1642 and tell me it's you who told me about this because, oh my gosh, it's awesome. So that is the clay portion of the show. The confetti portion of the show is actually part of our book talk. Chapter 35. Chapter 35, this is one of those chapters where if you can put a little star next to it or... Write down a little reminder telling you to come back and listen to this in a couple of months because you're probably going to want to revisit some of the things that get said in here. This is one of those chapters. We will finally really get a post-Monsieur Morel 
happy chapters, a post all of that Count of Monte Cristo. We really, really get to see him today. He is not Sinbad the Sailor. He is not our old sweet Edmund who is just trying to do nice things for people. And in fact, over at Audible, B.J. Harrison, who did the marvelous reading of Three Men in a Boat for us. And if you aren't a premium member, but you're interested in Three Men in a Boat, it is now up in the shop and there's a link to it in the show notes if you wanted to to grab yourself a copy of that because it's so funny. Absolutely marvelous end of the summer beach reading. B.J. Harrison, who did that spectacular reading for us, he did a version of The Count of Monte Cristo, which is available at Audible. And his reading of The Count in this particular chapter, I think is so extremely well done. This is a really, really hard chapter to perform. And it's one of the two chapters that made me stop and pay attention to BJ. And it's why I contacted him about reading Three Men in a Boat for us. Not because he's so funny in the chapter, but because he's that good. So we'll talk more about what the Count has to say in this chapter after we listen to it. But before that, he keeps using a phrase, and I think we've actually heard it once or twice already, confetti. They're talking about confetti, and they are not talking about little tiny pieces of paper. They're talking about sweetmeats. And if you're unfamiliar with the term sweetmeats, it would be like nut meat, not like ham. It's the meat of a nut that's been covered in some kind of sweetened substance. used to be honey until they got sugarcane. Once they were able to treat sugarcane sugar with water, boil it, make a syrup, pour that over something like an almond, and let it dry to the point where it has a hard coating or a not quite so sticky as honey coating. Then the sweetmeats became really interesting because you could throw them. (laughs) There is a whole history of confetti making that is extensive and fascinating. And I will put a link to it in the show notes because the temptation is just to read you the whole website that I found on the subject. But in a nutshell, Confetti, when you hear them talking about it, is little pieces of sweet dried fruit, sweet nuts, any kind of small edible thing that they could cover in sugar. And then sometimes, and it sounds like it was in our book chapter, sometimes these little tiny treats, they were dusted with flour or something like cornstarch to keep them from sticking to each other. But it would mean that you'd have flour residue or cornstarch residue on the outside of it which is kind of great because then it's not going to stick to your skin or your fingers or you, and it's not going to stick to your clothes. That would be bad because we know how hard it was to wash clothes back then. So it all makes sense, right? You'll hear the term major domo. This is like the head steward or it's like a step above ballot. Oh, if you saw the remains of the day, it's Anthony Hopkins. It's the guy who takes control of making arrangements for you in your daily life and your extended journeying if you are someone who has servants and the money to have a major domo. A guillotine is the French term for the capital punishment machine designed to be more humane. There is a variation on that in Italian, the mandaia. It's very similar. I think the blade is shaped differently. And I think there's a difference in height. You'll hear of Carabinieri. These are policemen in Rome. And I think everything else that gets stated that is odd or archaic is actually going to be explained by the Count. This is wonderful because Franz and Albert, being foreigners, they have everything to learn like we do. And so as the Count goes during this chapter, we get a lot of little bits and pieces explained to us, which is great. So a final word of warning. I mentioned it in passing last week. I am mentioning it now right before the chapter. If you are listening to this book with younger children, I highly recommend you listen to the chapter first on your own before playing it for them. It's not that it's that bad. It's just that There are some kids who are smart enough to understand everything that they're hearing. And it's a decision that you should make as to whether you want them to actually hear it. (laughs) And with that little teaser, let's listen to Chapter 35 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, 
Read for us by David Clark. Chapter 35 La Mazzolata Gentlemen, said the Count of Monte Cristo as he entered, I pray you excuse me for suffering my visit to be anticipated, but I feared to disturb you by presenting myself earlier at your apartments. Besides, you sent me word that you would come to me, and I have held myself at your disposal. France and I have to thank you a thousand times, Count, returned Albert. You extricated us from a great dilemma, and we were on the point of inventing a very fantastic vehicle when your friendly invitation reached us. Indeed, returned the Count, motioning the two young men to sit down. It was the fault of that blockhead Pastrini that I did not sooner assist you in your distress. He did not mention a syllable of your embarrassment to me, when he knows that, alone and isolated as I am, I seek every opportunity of making the acquaintance of my neighbours. As soon as I learned I could in any way assist you, I most eagerly seized the opportunity of offering my services. The two young men bowed. Franz had, as yet, found nothing to say. He had come to no determination, and as nothing in the Count's manner manifested the wish that he should recognise him, he did not know whether to make any allusion to the past, or wait until he had more proof. Besides, although sure it was he who had been in the box the previous evening, he could not be equally positive that this was the man he had seen at the Colosseum. He resolved, therefore, to let things take their course without making any direct overture to the Count. Moreover, he had this advantage. He was master of the Count's secret, while the Count had no hold on France, who had nothing to conceal. However, he resolved to lead the conversation into a subject which might possibly clear up his doubts. "'A Count,' said he, "'you have offered us places in your carriage.' and at your windows in the Rospoli Palace. Can you tell us where we can obtain a sight of the Piazza del Popolo? Ah, said the Count, negligently looking attentively at Morcerf, is there not something like an execution upon the Piazza del Popolo? Yes, returned Franz, finding that the Count was coming to the point he wished. Stay, I think I told my steward yesterday to attend to this, "'Perhaps I can render you this slight a service also.' He extended his hand and rang the bell thrice. "'Did you ever occupy yourself,' said he to France, "'with the employment of time and the means of simplifying the summoning your servants? "'I have. "'When I ring once, it is for my valet, "'twice for my majordomo, thrice for my steward. "'Thus I do not waste a minute or a word. "'Here he is.' A man of about forty-five or fifty entered, exactly resembling the smuggler who had introduced France into the cavern, but he did not appear to recognize him. It was evident he had his orders. "'Monsieur Bertuccio,' said the Count, "'you have procured me windows looking on the Piazza del Popolo, as I ordered you yesterday?' "'Yes, Excellency,' returned the steward, "'but it was very late.' "'Did I not tell you I wished for one?' replied the Count, frowning. "'And your Excellency has one, which was let to Prince Lobenieff. "'But I was obliged to pay a hundred. "'That will do, that will do, Monsieur Bertuccio. "'Spare these gentlemen all such domestic arrangements. "'You have the window. That is sufficient. "'Give orders to the coachman, and be in readiness on the stairs to conduct us to it.' "'The steward bowed.' and was about to quit the room. "'Ah,' continued the Count, "'be good enough to ask Pastrini if he has received the tavoletta, and if he can send us an account of the execution.' "'There is no need to do that,' said Franz, taking out his tablets, "'for I saw the account, and copied it down. "'Very well, you can retire, Signor Bituccio, "'but let us know when breakfast is ready. "'These gentlemen,' added he, turning to the two friends. "'Will, I trust, do me the honour to breakfast with me?' Uh, "'But, my dear Count,' uh, said Albert, "'we shall abuse your kindness.' "'Not at all. On the contrary. You will give me great pleasure. 
"'You will, one or other of you, perhaps both, return it to me at Paris. "'Signor Bertuccio, lay covers for three. "'He then took Francis' tablets out of his hand. "'We announce,' he read, in the same tone with which he would have read a newspaper, "'that to-day, the 23rd of February, will be executed Andrea Rondolo, "'guilty of murder on the person of the respected and venerated Don Cesare Torlini.' canon of the church of st john letteran and a peppino called rocca priori convicted of complicity with the detestable bandit luigi vampa and the men of his band hmm. the first will be mazzolato the second decapitato yes continued the count it was at first arranged in this way but i think since yesterday some change has taken place in the order of the ceremony really said franz yes i passed the evening at the cardinal rospelliosi's and there mention was made of something like a pardon for one of the two men for andre rondolo asked franz no replied the count carelessly for the other he glanced at the tablets as if to recall the name for uh, peppino called rocca priori you are thus deprived of seeing a man guillotined but the mazzuola still remains which is a very curious punishment when seen for the first time and even the second while the other as you must know is very simple the mandala never fails never trembles never strikes thirty times ineffectually like the soldier who beheaded the count of chalet and whose tender mercy richelieu had doubtless recommended the sufferer ah added the count in a contemptuous tone do not tell me of european punishments they are in their infancy or rather the old age of cruelty really count replied franz one would think that you had studied the different tortures of all the nations of the world there are at least a few that i have not seen said the count coldly and you take pleasure in beholding these dreadful spectacles my first sentiment was horror the second indifference the third curiosity curiosity that is a terrible word why so in life our greatest preoccupation is death is it not then curious to study the different ways by which the soul and body can part and how according to their different character temperaments and even the different customs of their countries different persons bear the transition from life to death from existence to annihilation as for myself i can assure you of one thing the more men you see die the easier it becomes to die yourself and in my opinion death may be a torture but it is not an expiation i do not quite understand you replied franz pray explain your meaning for you excite my curiosity to the highest pitch listen said the count and deep hatred mounted to his face as the blood would to the face of any other if a man had by unheard of and excruciating tortures destroyed your father your mother your betrothed a being who when torn from you left a desolation a wound that never closes in your breast do you think the reparation that society gives you insufficient when it interposes the knife of the guillotine between the base of the occiput and the trapezal muscles of the murderer and allows him who has caused us years of moral sufferings to escape with a few moments of physical pain yes i know said franz that human justice is insufficient to console us she can give blood in return for blood that is all but you must demand from her only what it is in her power to grant i will put another case to you continued the count that where society attacked by the death of a person avenges death by death but are there not a thousand tortures by which a man may be made to suffer without society taking the least cognizance of them or offering him even the insufficient means of vengeance of which we have just spoken 
are there not crimes for which the impalement of the turks the augurs of the presians the stake and the brand of the Iraqi indians are inadequate tortures and which are unpunished by society answer me do not these crimes exist yes answered france and it is to punish them that duelling is tolerated ah duelling cried the count a pleasant manner upon my soul of arriving at your end when that end is vengeance a man has carried off your mistress a man has seduced your wife a man has dishonoured your daughter he has rendered the whole life of one who had the right to expect from heaven that portion of happiness god has promised to every one of his creatures an existence of misery and infamy and you think you are avenged because you send a ball through the head or pass a sword through the breast of that man who has planted madness in your brain and despair in your heart and remember moreover that it is often he who comes off victorious from the strife absolved of all crime in the eyes of the world no no continued the count had i to avenge myself it is not thus i would take revenge then you disapprove of duelling you would not fight a duel asked albert in his turn astonished at this strange theory ah oh, yes replied the count understand me i would fight a duel for a trifle for an insult for a blow and the more so that thanks to my skill in all bodily exercises and the indifference to the danger i have gradually acquired i should be almost certain to kill my man oh i would fight for such a cause but in return for slow profound eternal torture i would give back the same were it possible an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth as the orientalists say our masters in everything those favoured creatures who have formed for themselves a life of dreams and a paradise of realities but said france to the count with this theory which renders you at once judge and executioner of your own cause it would be difficult to adopt a course that would forever prevent you falling under the power of the law hatred is blind rage carries you away and he who pours our vengeance runs the risk of tasting a bitter draught yes if he be poor and inexperienced not if he be rich and skilful besides uh, the worst that could happen to him would be the punishment of which we have already spoken and which the philanthropic french revolution has substituted for being torn to pieces by horses or broken on the wheel what matters this punishment as long as he is avenged on my word i almost regret that in all probability this miserable peppino will not be beheaded as you might have had an opportunity of seeing how short a time the punishment lasts and whether it is worth even mentioning but really this is most singular conversation for the carnival gentlemen how did it arise ah i recollect you asked for a place at my window you shall have it but let us first sit down to table for here comes the servant to inform us that breakfast is ready as he spoke a servant opened one of the four doors of the apartment saying al suo comodo the two young men arose and entered the breakfast room during the meal which was excellent and admirably served france looked repeatedly at albert in order to observe the impressions which he doubted not have been made on him by the words of their entertainer but whether with his usual carelessness he had paid but little attention to him whether the explanation of the count of monte cristo with regard to duelling had satisfied him or whether the events which france knew of had had their effect on him alone he remarked that his companion did not pay the least regard to them but on the contrary ate like a man who for the last four or five months had been condemned to partake of italian cookery that is the worst in the world as for the count he just touched the dishes he seemed to fulfil the duties of a host by sitting down with his guests and awaited their departure to be served with some strange or more delicate food this brought back to france 
in spite of himself the recollection of the terror with which the count had inspired the countess and her firm conviction that the man in the opposite box was a vampire at the end of the breakfast franz took out his watch well said the count what are you doing you must excuse us count returned franz but we still have much to do what may that be we have no masks and it is absolutely necessary to procure them do not concern yourself about that we have i think a private room in the piazza del popolo i will have whatever costumes you choose brought to us and you can dress there after the execution cried franz before or after whichever you please opposite the scaffold the scaffold forms part of the fate count i have reflected on the matter said franz i thank you for your courtesy but i shall content myself with accepting a place in your carriage and at your window at the rospoli palace and i leave you at liberty to dispose of my place at the piazza del popolo but i warn you you will lose a very curious sight returned the count you will describe it to me replied franz and the recital from your lips will make as great an impression on me as if i had witnessed it i have more than once intended witnessing an execution but i have never been able to make up my mind and you albert i replied the viscount i saw castaing executed uh, but i think i was rather intoxicated that day for i had quitted the college the same morning and we had passed the previous night at a tavern besides uh, it is uh, no reason because you have not seen an execution at paris uh, that you should not see one anywhere else when you travel it is to see everything think what a figure you will make when you are asked how do they execute at rome and you reply i do not know and besides they say that the culprit is an infamous scoundrel who killed with a log of wood a worthy canon who had brought him up like his own son diable when a churchman is killed it should be with a different weapon than a log especially when he has behaved like a father if you went to spain would you not see the bullfight well suppose it is a bullfight you are going to see recollect the ancient romans of the circus and the sports where they killed three hundred lions and a hundred men think of the eighty thousand applauding spectators the sage matrons who took their daughters and the charming vestals who made the thumb of their white hands the fatal sign that said come dispatch the dying shall you go then albert asked franz ma foi yes like you i hesitated but the count's eloquence decides me let us go then said franz since you wish it but on our way to the piazza del popolo i wish to pass through the corso is this possible count on foot yes in a carriage no i will go on foot then is it important that you should go that way yes there is something i wish to see well we will go by the corso we will send the carriage to wait for us on the piazza del popolo by the strada del babuino for i shall be glad to pass myself through the corso to see if some orders i have given have been executed excellency said a servant opening the door a man in the dress of a penitent wishes to speak to you ah yes sir returned the count i know who he is gentlemen will you return to the salon you will find good cigars on the centre table i will be with you directly the young men rose and returned into the salon while the count again apologizing left by another door albert who was a great smoker and who had considered it no small sacrifice to be deprived of the cigars of the cafe de paris approached the table and uttered a cry of joy at perceiving some veritable puros well asked franz what think you of the count of monte cristo what do i think said albert evidently surprised at such a question from his companion i think he is a delightful fellow who does the honours of his table admirably who has travelled much read much he is like a brutus of the stoic school and moreover added he sending a volume of smoke up towards the ceiling that he has excellent cigars 
such was Albert's opinion of the Count, and as France well knew that Albert professed never to form an opinion, except upon long reflection, he made no attempt to change it. But, said he, did you observe one very singular thing? What? How attentively he looked at you. At me? Yes, Albert reflected. Ah, he replied, sighing, that is not very surprising. I have been more than a year absent from Paris, and my clothes are of a most antiquated cut. The Count takes me for a provincial. The first opportunity you have, undeceive him, I beg, and tell him I am nothing of the kind. Franz smiled an instant after the Count entered. I am now quite at your service, gentlemen, said he. The carriage is going one way to the Piazza del Popolo, and we will go another, and, if you please, by the Corso. Take some more of the cigars, Monsieur de Morcerf. With all my heart, returned Albert. Italian cigars are horrible. When you come to Paris, I will return all this. I will not refuse. I intend going there soon, and since you allow me, I will pay you a visit. Come. We have not any time to lose. It is half-past twelve. Let us set off. All three descended. The coachman received his master's orders and drove down the Via del Babuino. While the three gentlemen walked along the Piazza di Spagna and the Via Fratina, which led directly between the Fiano and Rospoli palaces, Francis' attention was directed towards the windows of that last palace, for he had not forgotten the signal agreed upon between the man in the mantle and the Transtavere peasant. "'Which are your windows?' asked he of the Count, with as much indifference as he could assume. "'The three last,' returned he, with a negligence evidently unaffected, for he could not imagine with what intention the question was put. Franz glanced rapidly towards the three windows. The side windows were hung with yellow damask, and the centre one with white damask and a red cross.' The man in the mantle had kept his promise to the Transtaverin, and there could now be no doubt that he was the Count. The three windows were still untenanted. Preparations were making on every side, chairs were placed, scaffolds were raised, and windows were hung with flags. The masks could not appear, the carriages could not move about, but the masks were visible behind the windows, the carriages and the doors. Franz, Albert, and the Count continued to descend the Corso. As they approached the Piazza del Popolo, the crowd became more dense, and above the heads of the multitude two objects were visible. The obelisk, surmounted by a cross, which marks the centre of the square, and in front of the obelisk, at the point where the three streets, del Babuino, del Corso, and di Ripetta met, the two uprights of the scaffold between which glittered the curved knife of the Mandaya. At the corner of the street they met the Count's steward, who was awaiting his master. The window, let at an exorbitant price, which the Count had doubtless wished to conceal from his guests, was on the second floor of the great palace, situated between the Via del Babuino and the Monte Pincio. It consisted, as we have said, of a small dressing-room, opening into a bedroom, and when the door of communication was shut, the inmates were quite alone. On chairs were laid elegant masquerade costumes of blue and white satin. "'As you left the choice of your costumes to me,' said the Count to the two friends, "'I have had these bought, as they will be the most worn this year, and they are most suitable on account of the confetti, as they do not show the flower.' Franz heard the words of the Count, but imperfectly, and he perhaps did not fully appreciate this new attention to their wishes— for he was wholly absorbed by the spectacle that the Piazza del Popolo presented, and by the terrible instrument that was in the centre. It was the first time France had ever seen a guillotine. We say guillotine because the Roman mandaya is formed on almost the same model as the French instrument. The knife, which is shaped like a crescent, that cuts with the convex side, falls from a less height, and that is all the difference. Two men, seated on the movable plank, on which the victim is laid, were eating their breakfasts while waiting for the criminal. Their repast consisted apparently of bread and sausages. 
one of them lifted the plank took out a flask of wine drank some then passed it to his companion these two men were the executioner's assistants at this sight france felt the perspiration start forth upon his brow the prisoners transported the previous evening from the carcere nuovo to the little church of santa maria del popolo had passed the night each accompanied by two priests in a chapel closed by a grating before which were two sentinels who were relieved at intervals a double line of cabiniers placed on each side of the door of the church reached to the scaffold and formed a circle around it leaving a path about ten feet wide and around the guillotine a space of nearly a hundred feet all the rest of the square was paved with heads many women held their infants on their shoulders and thus the children had the best view the monte pincio seemed a vast amphitheatre filled with spectators the balconies of the two churches at the corner of the via del babuino and the via di ripetta were crammed the steps even seemed a parti-coloured sea that was impelled towards the portico every niche in the wall held its living statue what the count said was true the most curious spectacle in life is that of death and yet instead of the silence and the solemnity demanded by the occasion laughter and jests arose from the crowd it was evident that the execution was in the eyes of the people only the commencement of the carnival suddenly the tumult ceased as if by magic and the doors of the church opened a brotherhood of penitents clothed from head to foot in robes of grey sackcloth with holes for the eyes and holding in their hands lighted tapers appeared first the chief marched at the head behind the penitents came a man of vast stature and proportions he was naked with the exception of cloth drawers at the left side of which hung a large knife in a sheath and he bore on his right shoulder a heavy iron sledgehammer this man was the executioner he had moreover sandals bound on his feet by cords behind the executioner came in the order in which they were to die first peppino and then andrea each was accompanied by two priests neither had his eyes bandaged peppino walked with a firm step doubtless aware of what awaited him andrea was supported by two priests each of them from time to time kissed the crucifix a confessor held out to them at this sight alone france felt his legs tremble under him he looked at albert he was as white as his shirt and mechanically cast away his cigar although he had not half smoked it the count alone seemed unmoved nay more a slight colour seemed striving to rise in his pale cheeks his nostrils dilated like those of a wild beast that scents its prey and his lips half opened disclosed his white teeth small and sharp like those of a jackal and yet his features wore an expression of smiling tenderness such as france had never before witnessed in them his black eyes especially were full of kindness and pity however the two culprits advanced and as they approached their faces became visible peppino was a handsome young man of four or five and twenty bronzed by the sun he carried his head erect and seemed on the watch to see on which side his liberator would appear andrea was short and fat his visage marked with brutal cruelty did not indicate age he might be thirty in prison he had suffered his beard to grow his head fell on his shoulder his legs bent beneath him and his movements were apparently automatic and unconscious i thought said france to the count that you told me there would be but one execution i told you true replied he coldly and yet here are two culprits yes but only one of these two is about to die the other has many years to live if the pardon is to come there is no time to lose and as he here it is said the count at the moment when peppino reached the foot of the mandaya a priest arrived in some haste forced his way through the soldiers and advancing to the chief of the brotherhood gave him a folded paper the piercing eye of peppino had noticed all the chief took the paper unfolded it and raising his hand heaven be praised 
and his holiness also said he in a loud voice here is a pardon for one of the prisoners a pardon cried the people with one voice a pardon at this cry andrea raised his head pardon for whom cried he peppino remained breathless a pardon for peppino called rocca priori said the principal friar and he passed the paper to the officer commanding the cabineers who read and returned it to him for peppino cried andrea who seemed roused from the torpor in which he had been plunged why for him and not for me we ought to die together i was promised he should die with me you have no right to put me to death alone i will not die alone i will not and he broke from the priests struggling and raving like a wild beast and striving desperately to break the cords that bound his hands the executioner made a sign and his two assistants leapt from the scaffold and seized him what is going on asked franz of the count for as all the talk was in the roman dialect he had not perfectly understood it do you not see returned the count that this human creature who is about to die is furious that his fellow sufferer does not perish with him and were he able he would rather tear him to pieces with his teeth and nails than let him enjoy the life he himself is about to be deprived of oh man man a race of crocodiles cried the count extending his clinched hands toward the crowd how well do i recognize you there and that at all times you are worthy of yourselves meanwhile andrea and the two executioners were struggling on the ground and he kept exclaiming he ought to die he shall die i will not die alone look look cried the count seizing the young man's hands look for on my soul it is curious here is a man who had resigned himself to his fate who was going to the scaffold to die like a coward it is true but he was about to die without resistance do you know what gave him strength do you know what consoled him it was that another partook of his punishment that another partook of his anguish that another was to die before him lead two sheep to the butchers two oxen to the slaughter-house and make one of them understand that his companion will not die the sheep will bleat for pleasure the ox will bellow with joy but man man whom god created in his own image man upon whom god has laid his first his sole commandment to love his neighbour man to whom god has given a voice to express his thoughts what is his first cry when he hears his fellow man is saved a blasphemy honour to man this masterpiece of nature this king of the creation and the count burst into a laugh a terrible laugh that showed he must have suffered horribly to be able thus to laugh however the struggle still continued and it was dreadful to witness the people all took part against andrea and twenty thousand voices cried put him to death put him to death france sprang back but the count seized his arm and held him before the window what are you doing said he do you pity him if you heard the cry of mad dog you would take your gun you would unhesitatingly shoot the poor beast who after all was only guilty of having been bitten by another dog and yet you pity a man who without being bitten by one of his race has yet murdered his benefactor and who now unable to kill any one because his hands are bound wishes to see his companion in captivity perish no no look look the command was needless france was fascinated by the horrible spectacle the two assistants had borne andrea to the scaffold and there in spite of his struggles his bites and his cries had forced him to his knees during this time the executioner had raised his mace and signed to them to get out of the way the criminal strove to rise but ere he had time the mace fell on his left temple a dull and heavy sound was heard and the man dropped like an ox on his face and then turned over on his back the executioner let fall his mace 
drew his knife and with one stroke opened his throat and mounting on his stomach stamped violently on it with his feet at every stroke a jet of blood sprang from the wound this time france could contain himself no longer but sank half fainting into a seat albert with his eyes closed was standing grasping the window curtains the count was erect and triumphant like the avenging angel end of chapter 35 so that happened in so many ways that chapter feels surreal but it is so so important there are so many little pieces of foreshadowing and the important psychological information that gets dropped in this chapter and it's why i say there will be several places during the course of the book where we will want to come back and go, hmm, I need to listen to that one again. It is, again, one of the most extraordinary things about Alexandre Dumas, that here he is writing this as a serialized work over the course of a year, and he doesn't seem to forget anything. I don't know what his record-keeping was like, but holy smoke, this guy is so good at laying down foreshadowing that he then remembers to pick up again later. It, it would be fascinating just to study his notes and see what he what he did actually write down and what he did just keep in mind. But aside from learning that children had the best view at the executions, the public executions, which I thought was just deeply disturbing, the many, many pieces that we come to understand about what's been going on start to get thrown down. It's like if the Count is holding the deck of cards, he's starting to deal them out. We have a much better picture of just how far his machinations are going and have already gone, because we know that he knows who Albert is. Franz, we don't know how he fits in yet, but Albert, we, we got that. He is Mercedes's son, which means he's also Fernand's son. And we know that Edmund was a little ticked off about them being together. So we've got that down. But is he trying to kill Albert? No. Is he trying to do him harm? No. He's treating him really nicely, in fact. Very generous. And very, as we now have seen, insinuating himself into the world of Franz and Albert so that when he comes to Paris, which we now know he is planning to do, he will have some friends. And oh, by the way, one of those friends just happens to be the son of his enemy and his former love. Hmm. Okay, that's kind of interesting. We know that he has hung out with or at least helped smugglers in the past because we saw part of his Sinbad the Sailor and Franz interaction. Franz learned about the smugglers that he was helping out. But now we also see him with Luigi Vampa. So not only is he helping Vampa out, but he's really going out of his way to save a thief's life. That does several things for us. It tells us a little bit more about how Edmond is constructing his revenge and who he will be relying on. It's not entirely unlike Sherlock Holmes and his Baker Street Irregulars. There's a benefit in having access to people who the rest of your class of society, the people that they don't pay attention to. That can be very, very useful. But more than that, it gave us a really, really important opportunity to hear the Count's rant, actually, on Peppino getting off and not facing the Mandaya and the other criminal's response to being left now alone to die. And not just die, but wow. Okay, everything I've read about the way Dumas describes his death is that it that's pretty accurate, actually, which I just find horrifying. But again, that's one of the reasons why I said, mm, if you're listening with kids, you might want to listen first. But I'd been thinking a lot about the Count's reaction to the criminal's fury at being left to die by himself in such an unpleasant way, even though he knew that Peppino wasn't going to be killed the same way. It didn't matter. Peppino was going to die. He wasn't going to die alone. There you go. It occurred to me that if 
Edmond, once he, he set off with the money of the Count of Monte Cristo and started kind of building this larger revenge plot that we are now watching unspool in front of us, if during his travels he had encountered only marvelous, wonderful, helpful, loving people, if he had only ever seen the best side of humanity, it's very likely that he could have dropped this whole thing. But now we know very clearly that that is not what happened, that he continued to see people treat other people inhumanly and inhumanely. And that's tragic. And this is one of those big, operatic, epic tragedies in one sense. But people wouldn't love this book the way they do if that's all this book was. So I found myself from this point on in the book, and I'm curious to know if it's occurring for you as well as we go along. I found myself going back and forth between really enjoying the Count as a character and therefore forgetting what he's doing. And then all of a sudden, something like a scene like this one will happen or, or something, something else will go on or we'll see scenes of him kind of behind the scenes working. And it would remind me, oh my gosh, right. That's who he really is. That's what he's really up to. And the constant interplay, the tension between those two kinds of scenes of him really being this generous, kind, open-hearted count and then wounded and vengeful Edmund behind the scenes. It's a really, really fascinating psychological study. And it lasts all the way up until the very, very last chapter. And it's that last chapter that prevents it from being Hamlet. Just so you're not thinking that I'm leading you down a path of desperation and depression. It isn't that kind of book. It's much more complicated than that. In such a, a wonderful, rich, interesting, you want to talk to everybody you know about the book kind of way. Or at least that's what it was like for me. So I hope you have as good a time with it as I do. I just got a voicemail from Amy who is one of the reasons why we are listening to The Count of Monte Cristo. And I thought you might be interested in what she has to say. Hi, Heather. This is Amy, Amy Crochets on Ravelry. You may remember that for the 400th episode, I read a portion of The Count of Monte Cristo as my favorite book. And I also mentioned that I, although I had read the book about 20 times since I was 16 many years ago, I'd only ever read the abridged version that we were assigned my sophomore year in high school. And I have to tell you that the abridged version that I've been reading all these years is a completely different novel than the unabridged original version that we're reading together on Craftlit. The scenes that they chose to, to leave out to abridge it completely change the story. Sinbad the Sailor, the only time I remember him appearing in the book in the abridged version is when he helps the shipping family. Um, after that, we really don't hear from him again until I mean, he may appear closer to the end of the story, but all of the scenes with Franz meeting Sinbad on the Isle of Monte Cristo, the entire scene with the Colosseum, the entire history of Luigi Vampa and how he came to be a bandit, none of that is in the book I've been reading all of these years. Even going back earlier in the book when de Villefort goes and meets with his father, Noirtier, in Paris uh, at the very beginning of the novel, that's left out. So what's happened, what Dumas has done in the original that was left out of this abridged story is um, the relationships haven't been explored. Franz's astonishment at seeing the Count of Monte Cristo and recognizing him as Sinbad the Sailor it doesn't exist in the book I've been reading all these years. He's a stranger, and he has absolutely no knowledge of him, doesn't recognize him at all, and he's as fresh to him as he is to Albert. It is fascinating to be listening to this, and I'm loving it so much because it's a brand new story to me, and everything's taking on a whole new meaning, and I can't wait to see how the relationship further in the book between Franz and the Count of Monte Cristo develops because it must, because there must be other things that are left out. Otherwise, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> this is so fun and so fascinating. And you are exposing me to a completely different and wonderful side of my favorite book of all time. So thank you. I'm loving it. And I can't wait to see what happens going forward. 
Have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye. Well, I had my suspicions about the abridged version. And I wonder, Amy was not the only one who said that she had read the abridged version when she was a kid. And I'm very curious to see if anyone else who read the abridged version as a kid is finding similar issues to what Amy is seeing. Before we go, two more things. One is that the War of the Worlds sneak peek that was going to be up last Friday, every single, I'm not kidding, time I started to upload it, we had a power outage. So I continue to try and upload it. I'm going to try it at a different time of day today. We're not supposed to get any rain, so fingers crossed. But we already had a power outage this morning, so I don't know. Clearly, something is not happy with me putting more of the world up. But it will be there eventually, and there are images that you can see. So even if you are a premium member and you've already listened to one, you might want to go and catch it on the YouTube channel if only because I found photographs, pictures, artwork that go along with everything that I talked about. It takes forever, but it's really fun when I'm done to kind of get a chance to go back and go, oh, I love that part. And I get to, to see the pictures too. So that's one thing. The second last thing is the book Jane Steele. Listener Diane posted about this in the Facebook group. And wow, when she first posted about it, I thought, really? It's Jane Eyre, but a serial killer. And that's kind of the tagline that makes you think, oh, okay, so Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, except it's Jane Eyre and Serial Killer. But it isn't. It is a remarkable book. And I'm a little over halfway through it. The Audible version is extraordinary, as Diane said. The reader does a marvelous job with all of the voices. It's one of the few times that I have listened to or read a book written in the modern era that is supposed to be taking place way back in the day and not had moments that pulled me out saying, oh, they never would have said it that way. She knows her stuff. The woman who wrote this book, she has paid attention and read a lot of books from this time period. Before I got the book on Audible, I was reading the reviews on Amazon, just the listener reviews. And there were a couple of criticisms, people saying, well, I was expecting more murders, <laughs> which I thought was, oh, well, okay, that's kind of interesting. But everybody else was a fan of Jane Eyre, who said, this is extraordinary. So if you're looking for some beach listening, and you've already plowed through three men in a boat, and you're looking for something that is Humorous. Hmm. Not humorous, haha. -ha. Jane Steele. I have nothing but praise for it. It's a lot of fun. Of course, it's getting in the way of me doing the other things I'm supposed to do, but, but that's okay too. <laughs> All right. Have a great couple of weeks. I will talk to you again in September. War of the Worlds will keep posting on the weekends, and I think that's it. Have a great one. I'll talk to you in a few weeks. Take care. Bye. If you like getting free audiobooks with benefits every week, please consider supporting the show over at patreon.com slash craftlet. There are rewards waiting for you beyond, you know, the free podcast. You can also subscribe to our premium streaming audio by tapping the red lock when you are looking at the app or at the show notes at craftlet.libsyn.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for a premium download subscription by following the links in the right-hand sidebar at craftlit.com. And if it's easier for you, you can always subscribe and review at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Like us on Facebook, support us at Patreon, and come with us on tour. For nine years, Craftlit has been kept going by the support of you, the listener. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>